Yeah. Um, you mentioned Elizabeth Warren. You mentioned change. You mentioned um, President Obama. And you mentioned President Obama going to his base. So a question that I'm going to ask you now, which has a lot is of great interest in America and is also of great interest, especially in the Caribbean and Barbados, is education. Uh, on the topic of education, so President mm. Obama is proposing to have, um, I don't want to know, sub, I don't want to call it subsidized or free um, community college education, which is great. In Barbados, up to recently, we had free education up to tertiary level because we have high taxes here. We have high direct taxes through income tax and we have high indirect taxes through VAT, value added tax. So we got rid of all those things like sales tax and all those things, right? So, but we're going through financial troubles right now. So the government decided that it was going to inf implement a, um, tuition payments for our university uh, uh, students here in Barbados. Now, there's been a great backlash in terms of talking or wagging of tongues inside our homes about this occurring when we pay high taxes and is for is part of our social contract. No. Many, not many Barbados know, even though I was in the newspaper, I am the person who led the charge on a march through our town near Parliament in, against the tuition fee payment. Now, the argument is that why are we paying such high taxes to a government if the government does little for us? We're supposed to get our education, security, health care, and some defense when necessary, internal and external. Right? Right. It, why is it that it, whatever country <coughs> you're in, it seems as though when you have a government, a central place of power, it takes from you on the promise that it will get, redistribute your wealth to you and as soon as it has the money. Or after a few years, it just takes it away. Why, why do you think that happens in, in democracy where we're supposed to have a say? Right. Very good question, right? I wish, uh, I wish the person who could answer that question had the power to, to change it. Uh, <laughs> why does it happen? Aren't we all asking that? Uh, yeah, I didn't know that about the Barbados education system, but isn't it like that everywhere right now? I mean, you're 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 right in the trend happening all through the world. In in Santiago, the students in Chile, they're on the verge. They were on the verge of taking the country, you know, hostage in a sense, in a good sense of shutting the country down to awaken people to the education crisis there. Or the students in Quebec, in Montreal, two years ago. Um, I think education, when we take that away. That's the clearest sign, right, of we're giving the state, we're, we're submitting and giving our money and paying taxes on everything we buy at the store and on our own jobs that we don't get to take home the money. And if we're not even able to educate our children, ourselves and our children, um, without going in in America, you, you don't have like we do where you simply go into 30, 40, 50, 100,000 dollars in debt simply to have the right to study for three or four years at college. Or, or a quarter of a million in debt. You want to go to a private school? You want to go to you know a school that charges fifty, sixty thousand a year? Well, there's a quarter of a million dollars in debt if if you don't you know have any of the money and and uh, get grants. Um, so it's completely outrageous, right? It's it's a system for the wealthy to consolidate in a sense their hold on on power because those who go to the great insti you know the institutions get the big jobs and and continue the policies that we have. Um, yeah, I think it's completely outrageous, and I think the whole world right now is seeing, with the austerity movement in Europe, it's the clearest example right now of this rejection of their being told to sacrifice. They're not yet being having their education taken away from them the way you are and the way that we've had for now decades. We're only beginning to imagine um, an America where we actually help subsidize and help finance people's education. Um, but absolutely, this idea of if you don't give us the basics that we that government promises, which is, as you say, security, of course, in the streets, you want to be protected and not have uh, people running around threatening to steal your home, steal your, steal your food. Um, you get security, you get transportation, you get education, you get uh, health care, right? In America currently, yeah, we don't have health care and we don't have education uh, for the people. We pay a lot for it and we have the worst record uh, pretty much in the Western, in the, in the modern industrialized world. Um, nobody compares to us in terms of the level that we pay compared to what we get, uh, get out of it. Um, these are all fuel, I think, for the social movements that we're all driving. I mean, if you're leading that down in Barbados, uh, there's people leading it everywhere, right? Student movements rejecting the austerity, the cutting back government uh, narrative 
are rejecting it everywhere. I think we have to. I think we have to. I think students are everywhere should be probably coming up with even more bold, radical solutions. Whether it means starting new free schools and and recruiting professors and teachers to open up new branches of schools that that we ourselves, the people, somehow finance through our own collective crowd sharing, crowd sourcing type of uh, financing, or whether we simply refuse to uh, and stop going and stop paying the bills uh, when when governments you know unilaterally decide okay sorry rather than cutting money for the you know the tax breaks for our companies now we're going to take this you know such and such millions of dollars and take it out of the education budget we simply have to reject that and be loud about it um, and sometimes that means I guess doing what you did what did you do marched in and uh, you guys shut down the city for a, no, a day because, well the thing is right about the Caribbean on a whole especially Barbadians they were talking inside their homes where they would not come out so we had sizable numbers but we didn't have the greatest numbers but we did get a good response because then the Prime Minister actually spoke to the President of our Guild and we got something going but guess what this year people are paying tuition fees but the numbers at the university um, campus here are down of course they're down this was already done in Trinidad where no, unlike Barbados, Barbados is basically homogenous, which means we basically have people of African descent. Trinidad now has people of Eastern Indian descent, and it has people of African descent. It's a good mixture, just like Guyana. Now, when the, it was done in Trinidad a few years ago, what happened is it actually disproportionately affected people of African descent. So they actually started going to university, and they had a reinstituted, which is called the GATE program, so that people were allowed... All people were allowed to go to university. Now, the problem is that in, with Barbados, Barbados is the flagship of education in the Caribbean. So yeah. when you take away free education uh, uh, in any way from up to tertiary level for Barbadians and looking to do it not just for the university but for our technical um, college, what happens is that the rest of the Caribbean islands that were looking to go the same route as Barbados, they say, well, it actually gives the politicians that excuse to say, no, we have to hold on because we have more important issues. So you have uh, academics going out saying, hey, we want, our, we want St. Lucia, we want Dominica, Grenada, all these countries to go this route. Barbados, please don't go that route. But what happens is the politicians use the economic crisis globally as an mm -hmm. excuse to <clears throat> tax the people more and to take away from the people. And on that note, I want to ask you another question. There's a movement in America... Um, I cannot remember what it's called, but there are these citizens who declare themselves not part of the the, um, the federation. And then there's another movement where um, some citizens don't pay uh, uh, income tax because it's call it illegal because they look at the constitution and say there's supposed to be no direct tax on your prop on your earned property from your labor. What is your? Do you have any concerns when it comes to income tax itself? I, other than this um, exclusive or other taxes, income tax because. Income tax seems to be one of those things that, unlike other taxes, it seems to be a tax that is not beneficial to anyone. It's only beneficial to the government. Well, I mean, I, I'd rather not talk that deeply on this issue because it's not, I mean, I think we should, I think that any society that wants to receive the benefits of security and of health and of roads being repaired and bridges being repaired and built and new infrastructure and electricity being provided, all of these things... They don't materialize out of nothing, right? Someone has to do it. And, you know, some hundreds of years ago, they developed a system. We're not, we're not paying a king to do it now. We're not paying with, you know, 30 sacks of corn that we've rounded up from our and deliver as, as part of our payment. We pay in money. We pay part of our salaries in order not just for security but for all the services of modern life. Um, I, I think that modern liberal democracies, that's how they function. You give the government in Sweden and in, in Northern Europe, they give them, what, 50% or up to 60% sometimes, whatever. Half of your earnings, but you get everything. You get your. You don't have to think of how your kid's going to be educated or clothed or fed or whether your trains are going to work. Your government functions. It takes your money, but it does something with it. And they have the highest standard of living anywhere. Um, in America, unfortunately, we, we pay a fair amount of taxes and we get very little in return. And I think that happens... Uh, obviously, where you are and across Latin America and across Africa and Asia, maybe not so much over there, but places where you're not getting compensated for the amount you're putting in. I'm not in this camp. This is you, what you're describing is, um, I suppose, something of the Tea Party 
kind of line of thought or even more yeah, extreme? Even more extreme, actually, yeah. More extreme, like libertarian. I mean, you're, you're describing kind of a libertarian Anarchist, people who, yeah. who want to kind of disappear government. I mean, <laughs> income tax, What you want me to pay anything? Well, what do you want to do, man? Live with your rifle? Uh, <laughs> anyone who comes at your door, you pretty much just got to defend your home and because, you know, you don't pay money, so you don't expect anyone to look out for you. I mean, that's a crazy... Uh, <laughs> You want to not pay any taxes? Well, good luck, you know, starting up your car and having gasoline brought to you and, and having a road to drive on uh, or anything. I think it's a pretty uh, otherworldly view and it's a fantasy. We have to pay something so that we can get services. Um, where the taxes get spent, that's the issue. Do we spend them on oil corporations and give them $6 billion a year in, uh, in, in corporate tax breaks the way we do in America to the very companies that are tearing down the renewable energy uh, industry, you know, and propagandizing a climate denial movement to make us think that climate change isn't happening. Do we keep subsidizing the worst actors, the banks that, that played monopoly with the global economy and, and, and lost four million, you know, American homes and uh, millions of American jobs? Do we pay them trillions in bailouts to keep them subsidized and afloat? Those are the questions where our tax money should go. That's what's outrageous. Um, so, yeah, I'm not in favor of getting rid of uh, taxes in that way. I did want to say, though, you said about people in Barbados watching TV and in their homes and talking, they're, they're, they're on board with you and they agree with these issues, like that education should be there for people and you shouldn't be fleeced of your money simply to be, have a right to study. And what's it going to take to get them off of, out of the living rooms, out of simply the, the quiet, enclosed, family, safe place, where everyone who agrees on these issues has the courage, not just the courage, because I think people do have courage. I think that's what this whole, from the Arab Spring onward, it's like, no one's, there's not a lack of courage. Maybe Russia and China and places where you really get thrown in jail, or worse, when you speak up. A lot of places are like that. Saudi Arabia, we see this week with the, the man who was flogged, the blogger, because he dared to open a website that was critical of the Saudi regime. And so they make a point of that. Some countries, not pretty. Uh, I think yours and, and, and ours and much, much of our Western Hemisphere, we have a right to go and protest. We have, we have uh, for us, it's a constitutional right, and I think that uh, any place, uh, peaceful demonstrating and, uh, and people coming up with their own uh, kind of saying no, not, not doing it in any violent way at all. I think any time you bring that into the picture, then, you're, then it's asking for trouble because that's the state has a monopoly on violence in the modern world. Yes, uh, yes. But that said, if we're also in agreement on these issues, if you have 80% of Barbados citizens or, you know, even seven, whatever, 60, 70, 80%, if you have a clear majority that believe, you know, no, we don't think you should be cutting uh, our education and, and, and forcing us to be uh, yet another stranglehold on our, on our finances in order for us to study, you would think that they when it reaches the point where enough people are in consensus and we have the technology now. Everybody there, aren't you? Isn't everyone on smart... I mean, maybe yeah. not smartphones, but a lot of... Like, people or, or, or just simply online, on internet, yeah, on everything. social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and, and sharing this news. I mean, maybe the media isn't um, allowing you to confront your politicians the way you say, you know, the moment you confront one on the radio, maybe you'll be, you know, a pariah. You'll be, you'll be having to answer to bigger powers. But what about the people-to-people? -people? See, that's the whole, it seems like that's the beauty of this era of, of global protest is we're no longer relying on the, the channels of the state or the government to communicate our message. Uh, we don't require a press conference um, by the government announcing that the people are angry. The people express it themselves. They mobilize. They invent campaigns. They boycott places. They, or you go out and march or you start student-led uh, initiatives that are that, that get the word out. Um, you start new publications. You use media like yours. And uh, we're in an era when I think, like you say, people in their rooms and in their houses quietly in dissent, quietly angry, it doesn't take that much to organize. It takes leadership, which is why I go back to that subject. We need some people and groups with the vision to simply get people together, people who are in uh, consensus on these issues. We need to find a way. I think that's the magic. That's the... If people want the magic solution to our, you know, new 21st century era, it's how are we going to use the technology and the fact that we're all being kind of put on a, on a horizontal plane, horizontal plane together in communication. How do we now use that 
to harness the great majority consensus and get what we want in a, in a nonviolent and in a politically acceptable democratic way. We need to we need to know how to bring those people out of their homes, inspire them to take to be stakeholders in the change. You know.